Good afternoon, everybody. This is the Pass Ball Show brought to you by JohnPielli.com as well as St. Aloysius Church and School located on 935 Bennis Mills Road in Jackson, New Jersey. Lots of stuff we're going to get into today, but I want to throw a uh, just kind of a possibility out there. Anybody that's interested in contributing to the show, please <clears throat> let me know what's on your mind. And I'll try to follow through the comment feeds. I'll also follow through... Um, you know, phone calls, if anybody's willing to call in or interested, the number is 732-364-3598. That's 732-364-3598. Um, I, we spent a lot of time over the last couple of days talking about football and obviously the reaction to the Super Bowl. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that are out there making a big deal about the Patriots and where they sit right now. And I got to be honest, I mean, that stuff that doesn't really interest me that much. I mean, the bottom line is whatever team wins the Super Bowl should be getting a lot more credit. And I don't feel outside of the city of Philadelphia that the Philadelphia Eagles are the national story. And a team that's been around forever, you know, for the first time in its history winning a Super Bowl, you would figure that that would be a little bit of a bigger deal than it's really being perceived as. But once again, the focus is on the New England Patriots and where they go from here and whether the situation that they're in is, you know, whether it's destructive or combustible or whatever, whatever you want to, uh, you know, look at it as. I mean, to me, it's just not that big of a story. At some point, the New England Patriots are going to have a new coach. Could be 10 years from now. But at some point, it's the obvious, and it's once again stating the obvious, that you know they're, they're going to have a different quarterback. I mean, the media is making this story out to be something so much bigger than it really is. And I'm kind of tired of giving it time. You know what? The, the city of Philadelphia, which, by the way, you know, up until, what, a couple hours ago, was literally burning down from the riots that are going on. And you think of, when you think of, great wins in the history of a city and the reaction of said city. You figure there would be a lot more joy and happiness going on, not rioting and looting going down, you know, a couple days after, still, once the team won the Super Bowl. Uh, I mean, and that's something that, you know, probably has to be addressed at some point. You know, what is it with the fans of Philadelphia? I mean, when they won the World Series, the Philadelphia Phillies won the World Series in 2008. It wasn't like the, these same fans, who I'm sure a lot of the same fans that were rooting for the Phillies that year, were rooting for the Eagles to win the Super Bowl. So you would think at some point, you know, there would be some, uh, you know, cooler heads prevailing. But what is it about Philadelphia Eagles football fans that, you know, just can't wait to go out there and destroy their own city? You know, this should be a time of celebration. You should be welcoming a parade of everything that has represented the history of your franchise. 55 years, you, you know, where you're looking at whatever, 50, Super Bowl 52, the first time they've ever won a Super Bowl. I figured there'd be a little more joy going on. But once again, you know, the media isn't even focusing on that. The media cares more about whether Bill Belichick is going to be the coach of the New England Patriots after 17 years, or Tom Brady is going to be the quarterback, or whatever. I mean, the bottom line is the New England Patriots have set a precedence for winning that really hasn't been matched in professional sports over the last 17 years or so. They have been the top sports franchise in all four of the major sports. So, you know, the focus, because once again, like I touched on yesterday, the Patriots, their organization, and even to some extent their fans are put up on this pedestal because of their success and, they, and the fact that they have won Super Bowls. If they haven't won a Super Bowl, they've been to Super Bowls. So society, mainstream media, they want to see them fail. They want to dig up as much dirt as they possibly can on this organization. They want to send a message out to everybody that, that makes them seem vulnerable or makes them seem more vulnerable than they really are. And that's the problem. 
that's the problem is, you know, the, the media is leading the, you know, an assault on success. That's really what it's doing. You see it out in the news media all the time. Every time somebody is doing something good, there's somebody on the other side that can't wait to rip them to shreds. They can't wait to dig into their personal life and make sure that any vulnerability that they have, because by the way, they're human, so at some point, some vulnerability is going to come out. They can't wait until that's shown. And it's almost like a, the lower form of society is trying to make itself feel better by putting down any part of society that happens to be going through a good time or happens to enjoy a little more success than they do. Misery loves company. And the same right now is the media taking on the New England Patriots as if, you know, this is the end. Where there really is no proof that this is going to be the end for their franchise. And you know what it's doing? It's, it's building up what has worked and what has worked has been Bill Belichick and Tom Brady. And you know what? They're going to put together a game plan this offseason, and they're going to go out there and probably win the AFC again and be in another Super Bowl. But, you know, more people in the media and more fans, probably disgruntled fans because their own the team that they root for sucks, are going to watch this happen again and continue to be miserable and continue to go out of their way to try to slander, in some cases, everything that the New England Patriots have done. Create this image that things aren't so well in paradise. Say that the fact that they have won at the rate that they've won over the last several years is hiding all the internal issues that exist. Anybody that understands anything about business, which I know a lot of people that are tune into the show, listening and watching right now are, understand that even at the times of at most success, there are some things that aren't going right. Problems have to be dealt with day in and day out. And they are. Even for the best of the best, even for the people that are most successful, they got to deal with issues at some point. So we're, we're going to make believe that Throughout this whole time, through the 17 years that the New England Patriots have been successful, have won five Super Bowls, have been the three other ones, that there's never been any issues at any point. And what we're going to do with this is we're going to almost show, as the media, and in some cases fans, that you're jealous over the success that they've had over this period of time. Because you're jumping at the opportunity to bash them. Now, you can bash them because they lost all you want. You can talk about Tom Brady's fumble and that, you know, what what could have been that last scoring drive. You want to knock them for that. You want to knock them for maybe not being prepared. You want to get on, you know, Bill Belichick for sitting Malcolm Butler. You know, those are all legitimate things that you could have a gripe with. But the fact that there's almost like a... There's almost like a le legitimate, it's like a, a, a uh, what do I want to say? There's like a craving to go out there and try to destroy this franchise. And my question to you is, why Why does this exist? Is this more because they have succeeded? Is it jealousy from, in some cases, other fan bases? And for, you know, in, in other cases, just sheer jealousy of the fact that they've won and you haven't? Once again, a number if you want to be involved, 732-364-3598. That's 732-364-3598. Um, anything you want to share in regards to the comment feeds um, as it pertains to the world of baseball sports and unifying America, I will comment on in the show. Um, we... we I've been focusing a lot on football, and I'm going to spend some time talking about the situation that's going on in Major League Baseball. And I will tell you this, what really is frustrating from the perspective of, uh, we, 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 of what's going on, on in regards and to, about and of course I'm hearing my own voice playing now. And I will tell so you we're going to try the best really we can here to pause this. From the perspective of, uh, there you go, we did it. 
Congratulations. So now the comment feed's available on Periscope as well as Facebook Live. So going back to what I was saying, you know, baseball is in a situation where it is probably as ugly of a situation between the Players Association and the owners as it was in 1992, 1993, which ended up leading to the strike in 1994. And, you know, most of us are old enough to remember the labor disagreements and the issues that were going on at that time. And we decided, you know, we, you know, in, you know, we, we realized there was such a mistake what ended up happening and how baseball ended up hurting itself and almost taking a fan base that was all over the country scattered and making them not want to follow the game anymore. And what I'm seeing that's going on right now seems to be a little bit of a prelude to what could be a very disgusting situation in baseball again. Now, is it all over greed? No. But once again, the players and the Players Association and the agents have taken this stance of almost some sort of entitlement that they have that... They should be not only compensated well, but compensated at, an, at, at a rate that they tend to pick their own salaries. Two things have bothered me. you got two contracts that are on the table that are well over $100 million. And that's J.D. Martinez with the Boston Red Sox and Eric Hosmer, who can choose between his hometown Kansas City Royals and the San Diego Padres. So you're looking at a situation there where two players that are very good players, I won't even say are stars. They have had their moments. J.D. Martinez, what he did in the second half last year with Arizona, was outstanding. He, he, had, a, he had a great run. 45 home runs in just 100 and something games, which was ridiculous. But he's not a, he's not a, a top of the league player. He's not in the top five. He's not a top 10 player. Eric Hosmer, I, I could probably name about six or seven first basemen in all of baseball that are better than Eric Hosmer. So we're not talking about Mike Trout and Bryce Harper and Manny Machado and Aaron Judge and Giancarlo Stanton. Neither of these players can shine any of those guys' shoes. Yet there's two things going on right now. You have either the players who have drinking this Kool-Aid and have this entitlement where they feel that they are worth right now and so much, so much more than they really are. Or you have a problem with agents in Major League Baseball. And I don't think we'll ever get to a point, or if we ever do, it probably won't be for a long time, where the players actually start to question the agents and their own motives. Because the agents are in it for one thing. They're in it to make money. They're in it to generate a business. A lot of these top agents run their own agencies. They got hundreds of people working for them in all wakes, shapes, or forms. Being at the baseball winter meetings over the last several seasons, you see a lot of the non-name agents that are over there networking, looking to kind of get themselves going. They're working for a certain agency, but they haven't built up their own reputation and their own name yet. So I, I get it from the agent's perspective. They're looking to you know build within their own core, especially if you're a new agent or an agent that hasn't had a lot of success yet. Maybe a lot of guys you represent are minor league players. Well, you're waiting for that minor league player to become a star in Major League Baseball, or you're waiting to get a couple players that are already in the major leagues to join your agency. I understand it's a cutthroat business. It's it, it, it's tough to be. In. You know, it's a dog eat dog world, just like any other sort of business. But now you have the top agents, you know, the Scott Boris's of the world, calling out Major League Baseball, calling out the players, you know, you know, the owners and the teams for being stingy or not giving the players what agents think that these players should be making. Now, if I'm representing a player and I can get that player $125 million over five years, I did my job. But when the one team that is 
been willing to pay said player that type of contract is not budging and there's nobody else competing with this other team, it is time to concede a little bit. It's time to look in the mirror and realize that this may be a little bit of a change in the times. And if not, you're part of the problem. And if we're looking of where to throw the blame, because if you go back to 1994, I remember doing a, a paper in college about you know the 1994 baseball player strike and where the blame could kind of be put on. Obviously, the victims were the fans. You know, were, were the owners engaging in some stuff that they shouldn't have been engaging in? Sure. Were the players being greedy? Yes. And the dispute came over, you know, the owners that couldn't deal with the compounding contracts that they were paying players. And they needed, at some point, to put a salary cap in. The Players Association was steadfast against it. They wanted nothing to do with it. And they weren't going to accept under any circumstances in a collective bargaining agreement a salary cap. So they ended up having a strike. A strike that cost the 1994 postseason. Probably cost the end of the Montreal Expos franchise. And may have been the one chance. And I know that this team ended up getting the World Series two more times. But might have been the one chance for the Cleveland Indians to break their World Series drought. But the question is, you know, when it comes to play to players and the owners and a collective bargaining agreement in baseball, I think of something that one of my old history teachers told me. Those that don't remember their past are doomed to repeat it. And if you look at what's going on right now in Major League Baseball, maybe maybe you haven't been paying attention. Maybe You've been focused too much on your NFL football. Maybe you got your political beliefs that you're throwing out there, whether you're representing them in football or throughout the rest of the country. But there is tension going on between the players and the owners in Major League Baseball. And if you look at the 110 or so free agents, the majority of the top free agents that are still out there and unsigned, it's not a coincidence. If you go back to the 1980s, the mid part of the 1980s, the owners got together, whether it was from some kind of meeting or sending messages between them, letters, whatever they had to do in 1985 or 1984, and decided that they were going to set the market between themselves in regards to how much a player can earn. Now remember, that we're still in the first decade at this point of MLB free agency. Prior to that, the reserve clause existed, and you're you're looking at players for years upon years that were owned by the Major League Baseball teams that they worked for. So when it came for came time for a contract, it was whatever the owners wanted to pay them, they could either take it or leave it. And there were very you had very little rights in regards to being able to hold out. So free agency comes, obviously the, uh, you know, the site's decision ends up having something to do with it. A lot of Marvin Miller, everything that he sh stood for. And what ends up happening is the players start to get the upper hand. You know, Catfish Hunter signs a big contract. Uh, you know, a lot of teams, you know, mainly the Yankees, you know, the Red Sox get involved a little bit, the Dodgers. Teams start to sign players to big contracts. The Houston Astros signed Nolan Ryan to the first million dollar contract in Major League Baseball history. And the owners are pissed off. They're like, how did we go from having the upper hand and reserving a player's right to their contract for the next year plus an option and be able to determine their salary to all of a sudden have players running wild, signing with whoever they want, and by the way, these same owners can't control how much they're paying them. George Steinbrenner signing checks like there's no tomorrow. Charles Finley can't wait to get out of baseball. He leaves. Some teams are involved in free agency. Other teams are not. Creates a little bit of a divide. 
So once the Yankees and a couple other of the big market teams, not too many at that point, have set their roster and from not only a financial standpoint, but a room to add players on a roster standpoint, cannot engage in free agency. These other players that are at the same level, and in some cases better than some of the players that have signed for big contracts, are upset because they want theirs. And the rest of the teams in Major League Baseball, about half of it, have decided at some point that they are not going to pay those type of contracts. That's where the owners get together. And the owners decide that they're going to collude. They're going to collude with the players, the you know, with each other, and decide that the other players who have gotten certain contracts have already set the market. And because of that, there's no way that these top salaries are ever going to be, you know, met again. And that's was against the rules of baseball, was against the law, what the owners did, and ended up over time leading to a grievance in which many players were compensated for their misfortune. It ended up ending Al Oliver's career. It was determined by the, the owners that existed in baseball, the 28 owners that, I'm sorry, the 26 owners at the time, that there wasn't a place for Al Oliver. So he essentially has to retire. So you're looking at a situation that could be rearing its ugly head again. You got 110 free agents out there. And am I going to assume that collusion is definitely going on? It may be. It may not be. Either way, a market has not been set for this year's free agents. And the fact that Eric Hosmer and J.D. Martinez and Mike Moustakis and Jake Arrieta and you Darvish and the list is going to go so on and so on. I mean, Carlos Gonzalez, Lance Lynn, Alex Cobb, Greg Holland. These are all players that on a normal season would be number one compensated pretty well but also would be playing for a team that you knew could use their services and benefit from it. So this is where it's a little bit tricky. Because in any normal market or any normal situation, there is no way that these type of players would have no value to any Major League Baseball team. So that's why I'm thinking there's something a little fishy. And to imagine that a couple of these players may go into the season or into spring training without being signed is something we've never seen in baseball history. So looking back at what has happened, you know, where does the blame go? Going back to what I said earlier, talking about the strike of 1994, when we're talking about who are we going to assess the blame to? Was it greedy players that want, wanted more money? Or was it the owners who had finally had enough and decided that their reckless spending that they had had over the last, you know, almost 20 years finally had to come to an end. That they needed to be stopped from themselves. Because if you look at what had been going on, man, look at some of the contracts that have been signed by teams. Barry Bonds, his deal with the Giants. The Mets signing Bobby Bonilla. The Texas Rangers with Nolan Ryan. There were, you know, this wasn't the typical, you know, New York Yankees and maybe a couple other teams here and there. This was every team that was diving into the free agent market and owners were agreeing to pay players more salary every single year and bigger contracts and more lucrative deals year after year. So all of a sudden, are you going to feel bad for the owners? They're the ones that, that are forking over the money. And in some cases, as we're drawing parallels to some stuff that's going on right now in Major League Baseball, 
They're the only ones competing. The Red Sox aren't competing with anybody else. And you know what? The fact that ownership and Dave Dombrowski have put drawn a line in the sand saying, you know what? If somebody else wants to give you a bigger contract, let them sign you. But this is the most that we're going to offer you. Five years and $25 million a year. At some point, you're going to have to make this decision. How do, you, how do you all of a sudden, how does anybody feel bad for J.D. Martinez? And listen, I've spent the last four or five years talking this guy up. Like he was going to be a pretty good hitter. And I was right from the days when he was with the Houston Astros. I said this guy was going to be legitimate. He was going to be an all-star. But I don't look at him as an immortal. I don't look at him as a top five player in all Major League Baseball. I don't look at him as a future Hall of Famer. I think he's a pretty good player. A player that would be an, an absolute asset to the Boston Red Sox. Or to the Arizona Diamondbacks. Or anybody else that he would choose to sign with. But you, you're stepping into a, a territory right now. Where number one. Owners. Have been screwing up. For years. They continue to pay players essentially. Whatever they want. Whatever the agents have been able to negotiate, that's been determining the market. And they want to decide all at once, as we hit the halfway point here on the basketball show. Once again, it's John Pielli with you. The number, if you want to be involved, 732-364-3598. That's 732-364-3598. What I'm doing is I'm comparing the labor situation in baseball, which is going to turn into, over time, a labor situation. Um, a lot has happened in regards to the lack of movement in free agency. You know, we spent months, whether it was November, December, the early part of January, just talking about the market being slow. Now you're seeing that there's a lot more to it. Now, there's been offers to players, very lucrative offers. $100 million contracts have been offered to J.D. Martinez and Eric Hosmer. And I'm not saying anybody has to sign a contract that they don't want to sign. There's nothing wrong with that. But the problem right now is the agents are looking at their own reputation being on the line. And what they've done over the last, what, 35, almost 40 years, they've been able to get players more than the last players. Better contracts than the last contracts that were signed. Salaries to go up progressively year upon year upon year. And we saw a couple issues over the last couple years. We looked at what was going on in regards to you know, the top contract that was signed last year. And listen, it wasn't a, it wasn't a lousy contract. Four years, $110 million for Ioannis Cespedes. You know, Ed, you know, Edwin Encarnacion getting $60 million over three years. But it wasn't those $150 to $200 million contracts that we've seen. And the question was, how was it going to rebound with a better free agent class? And you can make a case that the free agents this year are much better, much more accomplished, have much more value than the free agents that were out there last year at this time. The only difference is a lot of them were signed. So as we sit right now and we look at the over 110 free agents that haven't been signed yet, the majority of them are top players. They're valuable players. But the problem, I don't think, is the players. And I also don't think it's necessarily the owners. Because the owners have been trying to do everything they can to curtail spending over the last several years. And what the owners did right is they worked in this luxury tax to the collective bargaining agreement. And once again, if anybody out there does not want to admit this, Major League Baseball right here in 2018 has a salary cap. It's called the luxury tax. How many teams are willing to spend way over the luxury tax right now as we sit here? Not many. And any team that is over it, perhaps the Boston Red Sox, Maybe over it by just a little bit. 
because they're worried. Every single team is worried about the compound taxes that they're going to have to pay on every dollar that they're over $197 million. So baseball players, led by the agents are continuing to try to sell themselves that they're worth more and more each year. The $197 million luxury tax threshold is a salary cap. So as we go into another off season after 2018, going into 2019, and Bryce Harper, and Manny Machado, and Charlie Blackman, and maybe Clayton Kershaw, and who knows... Maybe the 110 players that are still a free agent right, right now will be free agents then. Does it make sense for any business to pay a player $40 million a year when you essentially have a salary cap of less than $200 million? So you're talking about one player making up one-fifth or 20% of your entire team's salary. And what about a team that wants to go out there and sign that second player? So you're going to say that two players are going to make up a little more than 40% of your entire payroll? Now you want to go out there and blame the owners? You can. But at some point, it's a business. At some point, they have to operate to within the confines of what they have and what they've collectively bargained to. If the players and the players association was too stupid to allow for the luxury tax to become a salary cap, I look at the players association and I think it is I think it is run by by very smart people. Did the owners pull the wool over their head? Maybe. Maybe it turned out to be something that the players and the players association didn't expect it to be. And if that's the case, there should be a lot of players that are pissed off now. They're pissed, they should be pissed off with the association. They should be pissed off of what was collectively bargained, which right now is costing them money. But instead, it seems like from Tony Clark's perspective and Scott Boris's perspective, it makes the most sense to throw grenades over at the owners as if they're the ones that caused this. At some point, the baseball players and its association are going to have to come to grips with what they agreed to. And I believe they will. The players association negotiated probably the worst deal for its players since probably the reserve clause days. Now, salaries will probably plateau. I don't think they're going to go down, but I don't necessarily see them going up. When I look at the handful of top players that are still out there, I don't think anybody's going to approach $200 million in their contract. There'll be some $100 million contracts. Hopefully, J.D. Martinez and Eric Hosmer you know, start to realize that they have very good deals, which, by the way, in Hosmer's case, he's got two small market teams attempting to offer the biggest contract that they've ever offered in the history of their franchise, Adam. Not just one, but two teams. Two teams that have never spent that much money on one player's contract in their entire history one of whom he has spent his entire career with, won a World Series and went to another one with. They're going out of their way for him. Am I going to blame Eric Hosmer or am I going to blame Scott Boris? Scott Boris has gotten to a point where he thinks he is bigger and better than the entire game. And if you're a player and you're represented by Scott Boris... You should look in the mirror at some point because this guy is all out for himself. He's out to continue to build off of the empire he has already built. And what has he done? He has exploited just about every player that he's represented. Is he a nice guy? I don't know. You know what? Somebody may be able to 
you know, talk to the fact that maybe Scott Boris is a nice guy. But I tell you, I look at what he is doing and what's going on. He only seems to care about himself. And he realizes that if players' salaries go down, which inevitably they're going to, inevitably this is going to happen. At some point, the players' salaries are not going to continue to rise at this point. Now, I'm not asking for the players to turn on Scott Boris. But there has to be some respectful counseling that's going on. And it has to be advising a guy like Scott Boris in the right with the right information. If he's going to continue to play this game, in regards to J.D. Martinez, who are the Red Sox competing with? The Red Sox know that they're not competing with anybody else. So why would it make any sense for them to up, up their offer to J.D. Martinez? Unfortunately, the agent still thinks, you know, it's 2008. Or 2005. Or 2012. Maybe he's jumped in a DeLorean and gone to a time machine where baseball salaries are fluctuating at a rate in his own mind that aren't in real life. But here's, here's the point that I want to get into. Major League Baseball, for all those that love the game and support the game, there's going to be a major work stoppage coming in the near future. It's more than likely to come when it's time to negotiate the next collective bargaining agreement. And I'm not saying you heard it here first, because anybody with an intelligent mind could see this coming. If you look at what's happened over the last couple of years, and the fact that the players and the Players Association are... Now looking in the mirror, like, what did we agree to? We agreed to a salary cap. How, how are they going to deal with this now? Because they have curtailed their own salary by the agreement that they have come to with the owners and a commissioner. So, where did it go from here? Because I can't see, realistically another collective bargaining agreement being negotiated that includes anything that's close to a luxury tax. And the only way it would be possible is if the luxury tax was raised probably by about 30 or 40 million to allow for teams to go up to a higher level before they're taxed. The owners finally got some leverage. It's the first time that they have been able to curtail salaries in Major League Baseball Probably since the collusion days of the 1980s. You think they're going to take their foot off the pedal? Owners are happy now. Owners aren't getting in their own way. They're finally feeling it in their own pocket when they are a penny over $197 million in regards to their payroll. You know, every single owner in baseball, 30 out of 30 are all on the same page. They're all completely understanding that the more that they spend, the more money it's going to cost them. Sabermetrics and analytics are allowing teams to look at players in a different way. Find value where they've never seen value before. Be able to address certain needs which were normally costing them a lot more money with less money because they're looking at different numbers and these different numbers have different kinds of value. Plenty of things exist in Major League Baseball right now that allow for owners to not have to spend the kind of money that they spent before. And this 
luxury tax, which was put in there and agreed to by both the owners and the players, is 100% responsible for what is happening and what is going on. So, everybody that loves the game as much as I do, probably knows, or should know, if you don't know yet, that there is likely to be a major work stoppage in Major League Baseball when it comes time to negotiate the collective bargaining agreement. Because the owners and the players are acting as if they're two completely different entities now. And you go back about three years ago, and the relationship between the Players Association and the owners and the commissioner was probably at an all-time high. Players want to continue to get paid at the rate that they're getting paid. But now, whether you want to call it it or not, a salary cap exists. Which is keeping teams from being able to sign whoever they want for whatever kind of contract they want. The owners themselves may be able to afford these individual contracts. But when it comes to to being a sent over $197 million in regards to their total payroll, they can't deal with the ramifications of the luxury tax. A couple of years ago, you looked at the Los Angeles Dodgers and you thought they were going to spend as if money was going out of style. Magic Johnson and Stan Kasten said they didn't care how much money they spent. They just wanted to build a winner. Part of, part of the reason maybe they decided to curtail their spending could have had something to do with the fact that they haven't won yet. Finally getting into the World Series last year for the first time after you know, spending progressively for five, six years. But the other thing that came in is they were getting tired of getting hit with these luxury taxes. You know, that compounding percentage of just going up higher and higher Every dollar you're over. Every year in, in succession, you're over. The team that was the poster child for being able to spend whatever it wanted to found a way to get itself under $197 million for their payroll. Sure, it was a fluky way, the deal they made with the Atlanta Braves. But I'll tell you this. You look at what's going on right now and I don't think there's going to be any peace between the owners and the players anytime soon. I think it's an unfortunate situation and I tell you, if you love the game as much as I do you should be a little scared right now. Maybe not scared of what to expect for this upcoming season or 2019. But as we get into 2020 and whenever the next collective bargaining agreement expires, expect a work stoppage. Expect two sides to draw their lines in the sand. The owners, who finally got some momentum going in their own direction, deciding that they're not going to do anything to jeopardize that. And the players, who may in their own minds say they were misled into this luxury tax thing, are going to want nothing to do with it. So from a business standpoint, how do you see these two sides coming together? I don't think the possibility exists. And I know baseball has enjoyed a ton of labor peace. You're looking 24 years right now. Since the last work stoppage. And I understand the last one was a big one. But baseball hasn't had this type of labor peace for this long. Since the advent of free agency. So the question is, what has to happen? I mean, I'm hoping that there is a reasonable voice out there. I'm hoping that there's somebody that could stand up and maybe knock some sense into the players. Say, listen, nobody wants to take money away from you. Nobody wants to put you in a situation where you feel that you're going to earn any less. 
How do you best negotiate the next collective bargaining agreement? Do you get rid of the luxury tax whatsoever? Do you finally agree to a salary cap? Because think about it. What does a salary cap mean? It means at some point you're going to tell a player that there is no way that they can earn any more than this. And let's, let, let's be serious for a second. Let's not talk about the amount of money that athletes make. Let's talk about any job. You know, you hit a certain point and you realize that is top pay. You could do the same thing for another 30 years, but there's no way you're going to get paid any more than that. Well, what increases over time? Living expenses? Cost of living certainly goes up. You know, the stock market, unfortunately, is not doing well now, but will continue over time to grow. So inflation should grow with that. And you're going to tell somebody that there is, regardless of how much it is, there's a maximum salary that they can make at their job. And sure, there are probably some jobs that can get away with doing that. But mo most jobs, especially ones that have unions, reward its senior members. So in other words, somebody that has put in the most time will have a chance to make way more than somebody else that hasn't put in as much time. But the implementation of this salary cap is probably only going to make it tougher for players to be willing to accept it. Now, why does it work in other sports? Because that's a good question. You know, the NFL has a salary cap. The NBA has a salary cap, but their salary cap is a complete joke. All the clauses in there to allow them to go over it at any rate that they want it, as long as they're paying their own player. It's kind of silly. I mean, the NBA salary cap should not even really exist. You know, the Larry Bird rule. You know, allowing players, teams to sign their own players, even if they're at the salary cap limit, to contract and pay them whatever it is that they want, as long as it's on their own team. I know there was some constructiveness to that rule. It made a little bit of sense to benefit the small market team that may not have the opportunity to compete with the big market allowing them to go over the salary cap. But you look at the salary cap in the NBA, and it's a freaking joke. How many teams are way over the salary cap just because they sign their own players? So are you, is maybe Major League Baseball should design something similar to that. I don't know. But for the first time in the history of free agency in Major League Baseball, which is over 40 years now, Salaries in Major League Baseball have finally plateaued. And if anything, they've started to go down a little bit. You know, if you look at the deal that Todd Frazier signed with the New York Mets, or Jay Bruce signed with the New York Mets, both players were projected to get a lot longer term of a contract for a lot more money. And perhaps the only reason that the Mets, who are a small market team in a big market, we're able to get their players is because the market came back down to them. And we have to acknowledge what has gone on over this time. I mean, you can't be blind. Tony Clark, you know, the head of the Players Association, has to at least acknowledge what's been going on. You know, you got J.D. Martinez, who's being offered a five-year contract for $125 million. And it's talking about how insulted he is. When, by the way, there's nobody else that's even talking to him right now. It's not like there's four or five teams all negotiating for the rights to J.D. Martinez. It's just the Boston Red Sox. There's one team that's willing to offer you $125 million, And the other 29 teams don't want to offer you anything close to that. So he just looks like a fool. But how much is it the player and how much is it 
the player's agent that's trying to make a name for himself. And this will be the last point that I make about this today. Scott Boris has been very successful. He has built a tremendous enterprise. He has made a ton of money for a lot of players. There are hundreds upon hundreds and maybe even thousands of players that owe their whole lifestyle, their whole future, and in a lot of cases their post-baseball life to Scott Boris because what he's been able to negotiate for his players. He's not considered a top agent at all Major League Baseball for nothing. It's, it's not... It's not set up to where these players have fallen in, you know, a pile of you-know-what and gotten this money. They haven't tripped, fell, and landed in a pile of cash. A lot of what Boris has done has worked. But finally, we've gotten to a point where his power plays are getting obnoxious. They're getting pompous. And they're getting the sound like it's all about Scott Boris. So you have a you have a guy, and obviously everybody wants to hire Scott Boris because you know he can get you the most money. Scott Boris is now at a point where he can't get the most money anymore. So what is he doing? He's trying to turn it around, blame the owners, blame everybody else that can possibly be blamed other than himself. Boris is doing a terrible job right now. And he is doing his clients a disservice. And I'm not saying he should have his players sign for whatever teams want to pay him. That's what negotiations are for. If in the end he squeaks out a couple more bucks for J.D. Martinez and Eric Hosmer, good for him. But at some point these players are going to have to make a decision. Do they want to sit here with the blowhard agent that's next to them and not play baseball or at some point have to accept something that's a little less than what they were told they were going to make. And Scott Boris at some point is going to have to accept a little bit less of a commission. And how is that best going to work out for baseball, because that's the most important thing. I don't want to be sitting here in three years talking about the longest strike in baseball history because you got a jerk off agent that only cares about himself and his empire, and he's going to continue to power play when he literally has no leverage. The thing that's going on with J.D. Martinez is a complete joke. The Red Sox are competing against themselves. They're not competing with anybody else. The Red Sox know this. Scott Forrest knows this. J.D. Martinez knows this. Why are there no other teams involved in the negotiations for J.D. Martinez? Because there's no other team that wants to even come close to five years and $125 million. And the only people that don't understand that are J.D. Martinez and Scott Boris. I'm hoping at some point cooler heads prevail. Because it's going to take a player to sign a, what I would say is market value contract. You know, J.D. Martinez or Eric Cosmer may say it's below market value, but it isn't. Because neither one of those two players are anywhere near up in the top 5, 10, 15, or even 20 players in all of Major League Baseball. And if you don't believe me, fantasy baseball is starting up in another, you know, you know, month or two. Tell me how many people that play fantasy baseball would consider taking J.D. Martinez or Eric Hosmer in the top 20 overall in their draft. In the top two rounds. Or one and a half rounds. Or even if it's a bigger draft, two rounds. It's proof 
that you know what? If you want to set a market value for them, it probably is at about 125 or 147. It's probably not a penny more. We'll be back with you tomorrow right here on Periscope, Facebook Live, and available on demand on YouTube. Uh, lots of stuff we're going to get into. Um, you know, we talk about the NFL's issues that they have in regards to replay, define what a catch is, because I think that's something that has to be discussed. Hopefully the NFL does its job and defines what a catch is. If they do nothing else this offseason, that's what they need to do. Baseball season's about to start, but I'm telling you, my friends, I hate to be Debbie Downer. In a couple of years, we're looking at probably a long-term baseball player strike. We'll be with you tomorrow. God bless you. And as always, I'll see you on the other side.